So I love Buddhism. How many here have studied any little bit of Buddhism out there? A fair number of people. It's become quite popular out there. I think it, the reason why I really like it so much is it has this wonderful practical way of being in the world. It has sort of very clear kind of rules about how to be. And these rules are not commandments like that we think of. There's no consequences if you don't do them, other than you, know, you might continue to suffer. You aren't going to go to hell. But there are consequences if you do do them. That is, you create a better world. You, attain, you can attain enlightenment or freedom from suffering, what Don Miguel called heaven on earth. Now, I'm not an expert. I'm not a, a Buddhist master. But I have consulted those like <laughs> Reverend Arvid Strave. He's a colleague of mine who is a Buddhist master about some of these things. Now, <clears throat> as some of you know, say that the Buddhists follow what is known as the Four Noble Truths that has to do with suffering. And then there's the Eightfold Path. But if you follow the Eightfold Path, this is what will help lead you to enlightenment. And this is kind of a list of basically what the Eightfold Path are. There are eight things, right understanding, right aspiration, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. And they're sort of <coughs> divvied up into these different categories. Um, more by modern scholars than by Buddha himself. Now, I remember when I first saw these, I thought, well, they look a little sort of self-helpy, you know. <laughs> but, you know, Buddhism is more than that. It is a way of living in a world that's very practical and, and leads to the end of suffering. And what I love about Buddhism is that this advice, this wisdom, is still really applicable today. And it's 2,500 years later, right? We humans, we haven't changed all that much. We still kind of need this advice. And now there's a lot to cover here, and I thought maybe I should do a whole sermon series on all of these. But all I could do is just do one of these today. And so we're actually gonna be looking at right speech. Because I, I thought it was very important. We're living in a world right now where the integrity of the word, the impeccability, as our reading would call it, I think it's threatened. And this is leading to great suffering and pain in our world. Now, as timeless as Buddhism is, there is a difference between us and 2,500 years ago. I like to think of it as the internet. It's one of the big differences, right? I mean, Buddha, the Buddha lived in a, a very illiterate world for the most part, so right speech was really about how we spoke to one another in our language in talking. But today we communicate in lots of different ways. So right speech really in this modern world is not just about how we talk to one another, but it's the words that we write in emails, it's postings on Facebook, it's texts, it's even the songs that we sing, all the different ways that we speak, not just talking. Now, the Buddha was very clear about what it means to be right speech, right? We're gonna go through those. So here's the do's and the don'ts of right speech. The do's, pretty straightforward, right? Tell the truth. Now, I think all of us learn this, I think somewhere around age five, you know, don't lie. But it's really a lot more than that. It's about being genuine. Never saying anything you don't mean. It's like Angela in our story, right? She had to learn to speak from her heart, from a place of who she was, not who she thought others wanted her to be, or what she thought was the right way. So being genuine means speaking from that place. And it, it never say anything that you don't mean. I remember my uh, older sister, Kim, and her best friend, Suzanne. Suzanne and Kim, they, they shop together all the time. They're best friends. But they have totally different sh tastes in clothing, completely different. And my sister, Kim, had to learn that when she was shopping with Suzanne, not to go, ooh, you know, that's, what, what? no, that's awful. Don't, don't wear that. She had to find ways of going, well, if you like it, <laughs> I like the color. She had to find ways that were not mean. You know, she was to be genuine. She didn't want to lie and say, oh, that looks lovely on you, darling. She didn't want to lie. So we learned to speak from our heart, not to be someone you're not. It's also about keeping your word, right? So it's telling the truth is saying, well, I'm going to keep my word when I do something. When I say I'm going to do it, you follow through on it. The second thing, which is also fairly obvious, is be kind. Now that's really easy to do when you're feeling loving towards someone. But that's really harder to do when you're feeling angry towards someone. And we're going to go into a little bit later about how do you deal with it, with conflict. 
The other thing that the Buddha said is that it needs to be helpful, whatever your speech is. Not just about giving information, but it helps the person learn about you or the world or themselves, that there's growth in it. And to all of that, he basically said, then avoid idle chatter. So when we speak, he said, it has to have these three criteria. But then he also said, okay, I understand there's all the things you should do, but there are some things I'm going to point out that maybe you shouldn't do. And he gave us very specific examples. So one is don't gossip. Now, I think, again, most people know this one. You don't spread rumors around people. And I, I haven't really encountered that much in this community of people spreading rumors. But there's other things that are kind of gossipy, right? Like when you run people down when they're not there, right? You can't say someone's thing to your face that maybe you shouldn't say it to them when they're not there. Because this kind of makes an impression on people even if they don't know that person. If I come and I whisper to you, oh, you know, that one over there, watch out. You, know, you might think, oh, I'll make up my own mind. But it's already a little bit poison. The other thing that we do when it's kind of gossipy is we make up stories about motivations. These are more subtle things, right? We think, oh, I know why that person's acting that way. I remember, um, you know, and I actually, I think of myself as fairly intuitive, so I like to think I'm right. But oftentimes, I'm not right, and I have no idea. And I remember, I remember this one woman uh, back in my home congregation before I became a minister in Seattle. We had a small congregation, and we met in this uh, big gymnasium. It was great, high ceilings, everything, this big room that we met in. It was actually a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. But just as I was leaving, we had to change. Uh, we, had, we lost the, the agreement. The city wanted it back. So we had to go and find a new place in which to worship. And two people came forward with two different places. And one place, um, okay, so the room was kind of low ceiling like this. There were no windows and it was smaller than this room here. Um, but it had great RE rooms for our children. And everybody was really excited about that. But Mona had come up with a, a second alternative. She didn't like that idea. So she came up with a second place that had high vaulted ceilings and lots of windows. But it was terrible for the children. And so we had a town meeting to discuss these two options. And like 90% of the congregation was saying, no, we want to go. We can, we can worship in this space. That's fine. But you know, it has these great rooms over here for the kids. Let's do that. But Mona was getting more and more upset about it all. And I remember someone turned to me and just said, oh, it's, it's just because she wants her way. It's just Mona. You know? And I remember thinking, she, I mean, she's like getting in tears over this. And so finally I said, you know, Mona, why are you taking this so personally? Because she kept saying, you know, it's just low ceilings and there's no windows. I mean, how can we worship in this space? And I said, why is this feeling so personal to you? And she said, well, I'm claustrophobic. <laughs> and I was, everybody was like, this whole room just sort of went, oh, okay, that's what's going on. So then we could figure out how could we make the room not claustrophobic, right? But we all thought it was just Mona being Mona, being stubborn. Sometimes if we just ask the right question, we can find out what the real motivation is. But we do that all the time, right? We make up stories in our head about what's going on. <coughs> so the second type of don'ts that Buddha told us about is don't do dishonest speech, which obviously is sort of the opposite of tell the truth. It's like, don't lie, right? But there's more to it than just not lying. There's lots of different ways that we sort of subtly lie in little ways and we all do these things you know innuendo right and you infer in something there's locker room talk right that became big in the news <laughs> <laughs> and it's kind of strange that people sort of think you're like oh it's no big deal it's just locker room talk mm -hmm. but it's a big deal those words hurt people right and then there's exaggerations we all exaggerate at some point or another. I have a fishing story about the one that got away, and it gets bigger each time. I've tried, but tried really hard not to get it get too big. But we all exaggerate at some point. You know, we do the thing like, you know, oh, I was waiting for hours and hours. Okay, it was really just 45 minutes, but still, it felt like hours and hours. And so we exaggerate that way. And I, st I really tried years ago. An incident happened in my life, and I thought, you know, I want to stop exaggerating. And it happened because my twin sister, Regan, she ended up dating this compulsive liar. 
And she didn't know it at first, you know, she's just dating the guy and he kept doing these things to kind of try to impress her, right? And they started to snowball, like they would go to a movie. He was a, I guess he was a computer guy of some sort. Um, maybe did computer graphics or something like that for a living. And so they would go to a movie and she'd like, oh, I like that movie poster. And say, well, I did that movie poster, <laughs> you know? And so, it, you know, it's sort of like believable just enough that you go, oh, okay, wow, that's great, you know? And, but the lies got bigger and bigger. And eventually it got to the point where she started getting suspicious. So he said to her, you know, I just got offered a job in Southern California down in San Diego. I'm going to have to move down there tomorrow. <laughs> you know, she's like, what? You know, like, what is going on? She ca actually called the company and said, did you just hire this guy? And they're like, no. Of course not. So she confronted oh, no. him and said, you know, what is going on? And he, you know, he said, he broke down. He was in tears. He said, I'm so sorry. I am a compulsive liar, and I don't know how to stop. It just keeps coming. So she did some research about compulsive lying. She found that if to stop lying, you have to abstain completely. You cannot exaggerate. You cannot do anything. It's like alcohol, nothing. You cannot lie at all. And it got me thinking about, well, I exaggerate sometimes. And I started thinking like, hmm, I don't want my lies to get bigger and bigger. So I thought, okay, I'm just going to abstain, and I'm going to cut out exaggerations and I do pretty well at it I catch myself at times and sometimes I'll even say an exaggeration and I'll say oh I'm exaggerating um, but because sometimes I'll catch myself doing it but you know it's kind of an interesting thing thinking about how much we exaggerate do we want to be that way we also exaggerate about ourselves right we say things like oh I always do that you know I always lose my keys just as I'm trying to get out really always isn't that an exaggeration? Or, so, oh man, I'm just so stupid. I have, a, I have a friend of mine, a colleague of mine, and she, always, she thinks she's clumsy because a couple of times she tripped in public. And she is no more clumsy than anybody else, but she, this is her, what, what Don Miguel would call her agreement with herself, is I'm a clumsy person. And we do that, right? We exaggerate. So I encourage you in the next week, maybe even a month, Try to abstain from any exaggeration. Catch yourself. See what happens in your life. See how it feels to not exaggerate. Okay, so the third one, third don't. Don't be harsh. Again, this is something we probably all learned when we were young. Don't say mean things to one another. You know, insulting. There's this thing called smack talk and trash talk now. Which I'm like, really? This is how people talk to one another now? I think we all did learn that this is not something way that we want to be, but I think it needs to be said. But there are other forms of harsh speech that are out there that are, again, more subtle. Sarcasm, criticism, contempt. If you want to ruin any relationship, <clears throat> just put those in a relationship whether it's marriage or otherwise, sarcasm, criticism, or contempt, they will ruin relationships. And then there's another one that I've been kind of thinking about. It's this idea of teasing, right? My older sister likes to tease me, but I think it's passive aggressive ways of showing criticism, you know? Because my twin sister and I, we tease each other. We'll start insulting each other, Every once in a while, I say, "Yeah, hey, you witch, you hag," you know, and it, you know, it starts, you know, gets gets bigger and bigger. Oh, you Slytherin, you know, and by then we're just laughing, you know, on, on the floor because we're just it's so out there. That's teasing when everybody's involved in the joke, right? But it's not teasing when you're constantly putting someone down, doing some sort of social ostracism because of it. So watch if somebody ever says to you, "Hey, you know, don't say that," and you say, "Oh, I'm just teasing." Maybe it wasn't. <laughs> so in another type of harsh speech is swearing. I really like swearing. <laughs> this, is, this is kind of a tough one because isn't it so satisfying, right, to just let out a big old F-bomb? <laughs> there are times. But I'll tell you, about 20 years ago, I decided to stop cussing, for the most part. I'll, I'll, I'll put a little darn or a shoot in there every once in a while. But I don't do the F-bombs as much. Usually alone in my room, I'll do them. Um, but 
I stopped doing it because, do you guys remember back in uh, the 1990s, the shock jocks, right? They're still kind of around, but it's just they're no longer shocking anymore because everybody is. The shock jocks, their job on radio was to try to shock people as much as possible. It was also the time of like Chris Rock. I remember hearing he had this great stand-up comedy, but he dropped like every other word was the F-bomb. I remember thinking, this is funny? I don't understand. I grew up, you know, with other comedians that were a lot nicer, but I didn't understand why we need to suddenly swear all the time in order to be funny um, or to be entertaining. And I remember learning that, you know, swearing is a form, this idea of shocking someone, shocking is a, a form of violence. Now, I'm not really a goody two-shoes or anything like that, and it wasn't because I was thinking about becoming a minister, because I wasn't back then, but I just realized I am kind of a pacifist. I don't want to add to violence in the world, so I'm going to try to stop swearing. And I, you know, I understand some people come up to me, they're always shocked when every once in a while something does come out of my mouth or whatever. And I, I, don't, I don't mind if other people want to do it. That's fine if they want to do it. But for me, to me, that's that impeccability of the word. I don't want to harm anyone by shocking. Although just occasionally I will, in my room, scream in my apartment or something like that. It's something that's very frustrating because it is satisfying. It is appropriate at times. I will say that. <laughs> I just try not to do it at other people. All right. So these are the do's and don'ts of right speech. Tell the truth, be kind, be helpful, don't gossip, don't be dishonest, and don't be harsh. Those are pretty good advice, right? And all of these nuances that I just talked to you about, the Buddha talked about as well. It's kind of interesting that human nature hasn't changed a whole lot. I'm hoping that we get better at it. But so then what do you do when you have to say something that might be hurtful to someone else? Right? Sometimes you have to say those hard things. I've had to fire someone before. That's really hard, right? You don't want to hurt them. The Buddha was actually very clear about this too, because he didn't see, he said it's not about avoiding conflict at all, it's about doing conflict differently. So this is what he said about giving loving feedback. First of all, ask yourself, is it the right time to give that feedback? It may not be in the heat of the moment, Maybe you want to cool down a little bit, whatever it is. You want to speak at the right time. And are you speaking about facts, right? Now I thought, when I first heard this, I was like, well, wait a minute, are you supposed to speak about feelings, not facts? Well, your feelings are a fact. If you feel hurt, that's a fact. But you speak from your place. You can say, I, I felt hurt by what you said. But if you say, what you said, um, what you said hurt me, or I felt hurt by what you said. Um, if you make it about them, and it's their responsibility, it's your choice to feel hurt. So you wanna make sure that you're speaking from your own place of emotional, I felt hurt. The other is, you know, are you speaking gently or harshly? That comes back to that right time. And are your words helpful? You speak with a kindly heart, or inwardly malicious. Oops, I went back too far. So all of this has to do with, you know, how are we going to speak difficult words for one another? And all of this can also be used for everything. And he saw her there, and he thought, you know, is she gonna be welcoming to anything that I have to say because, you know, she's mad at me, and I'm mad at her. But he thought, I wanna come from that place of being genuine. I also don't wanna ignore the fact that we've had this disagreement between us. So instead he walked up to her and he said, you know, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for the fact that you took care of your father for all these years so that the rest of us could feel comfortable knowing that he was taken care of, they could live independently. Thank you so much for giving so much of your life to helping this man. She, he said the fight just went out of her. He said, now I'm the best thing since sliced bread. <laughs> he said, but gratitude, expressing gratitude towards someone <coughs> can heal so many wounds. You know, it was the right time. It was at the memorial service. He spoke the facts that she did. Everybody was so grateful for what she had done. He spoke gently and kindly, and it was helpful, was repairing their relationship. And you know, it seems like all this might be seem really simple thing to do. Just don't lie, be kind in what you say. 
but sometimes we say the wrong thing. We don't even realize that we're saying it. Last night, I woke up at 2.30 in the morning this morning and I realized, last night I lied. And I didn't even realize it when it happened. So just so you know, give you a little background, I spend about 10 to 15 hours a week on putting a service together. It's not easy. There's lots of research. I've got to find readings and stories and all sorts of things to put it all together. And I work with Beth on the music. I take this craft very, very seriously. Well, last night, I went to this wonderful, incredible concert um, of just beautiful music. It was a great way to start the Christmas season. And afterwards, with a bunch of people here at the church, we had this gourmet dinner. I'm like, oh, it's like the best food I've had in like a decade. It was unbelievable. It was oh, so great. But it was starting to get late. It was about nine o'clock or so, and I said, look at the class, and I was like, oh, I was thinking about how I had to get up early in the morning. I always get up early on Sunday, very early, about 5 a.m., and I polish the sermon so that it's fresh in my mind um, when I come here. So I started to make my excuses, and everybody, of course, understood, and one person sort of said, you know, yes, we know you've got a big day tomorrow. And I said, oh, I'll just wing it. <laughs> I just dismissed all of my hard work that I do, right? No, I'll just wait. I've never winged it in my life. <laughs> I work hard at this. And I realize that, you know, it's not just the way that we speak to others, but it's the way that we speak to ourselves. Women do this in particular a lot, right? Self-deprecating humor. Oh, I'll just wing it. Dismiss all of that hard work. Now, I'm, I think everybody there in the room knew I was joking, but I just realized at 2.30 in the morning. <laughs> so we need to say, it's not just about us. It's about the people we with, and it's about us. Because it does harm me when I devalue what I do and who I am. So I have another challenge for you this month. Try not downplaying what you do and who you are. And it isn't easy. We wouldn't have to make up rules about it if it were easy. Right? These rules are meant to call us back to our better selves, our higher self, to remind us of who we can be. It's not like a kind of bludgeon like you must be this way. You know, I've heard the term speak your peace before. When I was young, when I first heard it, I thought it was spe spelled with P-E-A-C-E. -E. I didn't realize as a common English idiom that it says it means to say what you mean to say, right? Say what you mean to say. I thought it meant speak your peace, which meant that we were to say what we needed to say, but in a nice way. I like my way of saying that idiom, actually. I think we need to speak our peace. We need to say what needs to be said, but we need to do it gently and kindly, without harsh words. Unfortunately, there are people like our president-elect, who are admired for being what's called a straight shooter, right? <laughs> Says what he's, what's on his mind. It's an interesting straight shooter. A violent metaphor, isn't it? This is someone who wants to say whatever they want. And I guess, so I suppose it's a kind of truth telling, right? The truth is they see it, but it isn't factual. It isn't kind and it isn't helpful. It's really the opposite of right speech. <coughs> Being a straight shooter is ultimately, really, in many ways, it's very selfish because it's all about me and what I want to see, say without any regard to the listeners who are out there. But we live in community. Right speech isn't about saying whatever you want. It's about saying words with integrity because it isn't just about you. And we've seen that people now think it's okay to be this sort of straight shooter, to speak without integrity, to ignore right speech. And hate speech is up, harassment of people of color, minorities, women, are, it's up 200% since the election. 200%. And it's not just one side either, let's be fair. How can we change this? I think we begin with ourselves. That's the only place really we can begin, right? I do believe in freedom of speech, but I also believe in the freedom to preach integrity. And we Unitarian Universalists, we are people of the word, right? We have our seven principles, our six sources, all words with integrity. They are holy words. It's not just people of the word, we're people of the covenant. A 
covenant is a promise. And they're words that are said with integrity. That's what a promise is, right? Words said with integrity. Each week we say this covenant, love is the spirit of this church and service is its law. To dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. These words mean a lot to me. I try to live them every day. Of course, we all fall short at times. But that's the joy of being human, is we get to keep trying. <coughs> and we have to do more than just say them. We have to be lived with integrity. Integrity is such a great word. I love that word. For me, it means living into your highest, best self. To say words with integrity, that's a holy way of being in the world. It's holy, and I believe we need to be more holy. Blessed be and amen. <clears throat> Let us sing. <clears throat> <clears throat>